You know, I've been very fortunate over the last couple of years to acquire a number of small wood burning stoves, otherwise known as twig stoves or stick stoves. One example is my folding firebox stove, which my wife gave me last Christmas. Lovely stove, great, enjoy using it. Another example is the Solo Titan. I was able to pick this up secondhand for a very good deal through Kijiji. Love using this stove as well. And as nice as those two stoves are, for some reason, I keep coming back to the humble hobo stove made with an IKEA utensil strainer. Lightweight, effective, very inexpensive, easy to make. If you're interested in seeing how I make them, how maybe you can make one for yourself, stay tuned. Okay, before we get started, I thought I'd take a minute just to go over the existing hobo stove or IKEA hobo stove that I use now, just to give you an idea of what the end product will look like on the one we're going to build today. So I do have a separate video where I demonstrate this video, this uh, stove in use and how it uh, all goes together, but I thought I'd just go over that very quickly. So the basics of the stove are the IKEA hobo strainer, and to that I've added a couple things. One is the feed port on the side, and I'm going to explain more about why I chose to do a feed port on the bottom half of the stove when we go to build a new one. On the bottom of the stove, I've added a couple of small bolts as feet to raise it off of the uh, ground just slightly to allow some airflow to come in through the bottom. And on top, I've created a crossbar system out of some aluminum uh, bar stock that you can make easily, and I'll show you how to do that and go on top. And those things together sit on a small piece of aluminum, which I can place on the ground because, of course, Unlike both the Firebox and the Solo Titan, there is no floor plate to the bottom of an IKEA uh, utility or utensil strainer. And as a result, wood ash can fall through and scorch the earth. And even worse, potentially ignite a fire in any duff that's underneath. So I like to have a small piece of aluminum foil that I can use to protect the earth. And I have a windscreen that will go around the outside. But this is a complete cook kit. So in order to have a complete cook, you need to have a cook pot. So this is a coffee canister to which I've added a bale and a pitcher hanger for the top of the lid. So they sits on top and together this makes it a very effective, very lightweight cook system. And if you're interested in seeing more about how this works, please refer back to that other video. What I like about this system is the fact that once it's disassembled, Everything goes down inside of the cook pot. I should have put that in first. There we go. Burrs. And now, I, and I also have a small sewing uh, stuff sack that I put this in because, of course, they do get kind of dirty on the bottom. All right, that's the one I have. But let's put that aside and start with the basic materials you need to build one of your own. So I have a brand new, well brand new, I picked up second hand at Value Village for 99 cents, IKEA Utility Strainer. Now this is the standard size one. The one I showed you in the kit a second ago is for whatever reason slightly smaller than this one. But this is the one that if you're going to buy one brand new at IKEA now, or if you find one at a, a thrift store like I did, this is probably what you're going to find. There is a taller version, which I don't have any of, I have seen, I just haven't felt the need to pick them up to use them as uh, a wood stove because this seems to work so effectively by itself. So this is going to be the foundation for our stove build. I'll put that aside. At the same time, in the same day, I was able to find another canister. This one is a sugar canister. I'm not sure if it'll show up, but it's actually engraved sugar on top. So it has a nice lid. It's all polished on the inside. The lid goes on nicely. And what I like about this combination is, is the sugar canister will fit in as if it was made to order right inside the IKEA stove. Now, it does take some searching sometimes to find the right combination. Sometimes you'll find a canister that's a little bigger and the stove will fit down inside. Or if you're lucky like I was this time, you'll find a, a canister that fits just inside of the stove. So that's the foundation of our build. But there are a few more items that you need if you're going to build the stove most effectively. And I'll share those with you now. All right, in addition to the IKEA whole, or utensil strainer, and the sugar canister, which I'll set aside now, there's a couple things you're going to need. You're going to need some way of supporting the utensil strainer off of the ground. 
Now it's not absolutely necessary and we'll talk about that in a minute, but what I've chosen to use for this project are three quarter inch angle brackets. And those three quarter inch angle brackets are going to act as feet on the bottom of the strainer. Now to put those brackets on, I needed some nuts, bolts, and lock washers. So I chose to use some very inexpensive machine screws, number 10 machine screws, nuts, and lock washers. And they will be used to hold the brackets onto the bottom of the, the utensil strainer. On top of the sugar canister, I need some way of being able to lift the lid off. So for that, I chose a pitcher hanger. And here, hopefully you can see the pitcher hanger. And I'll show you how that gets attached as we move through the project. And that will go on the, the uh, top lid and that'll work nice, just nicely. Now, I'll bring that back for a second. On the other IKEA Hobo kit, I have a piece of aircraft cable that loops around and is attached to the sides. And I will show you how that's done because I have had a request to show how I did that on there. But for this project, I'm going to do something simpler and something I think just as effective, maybe even more effective, depends on your point of view. And that is a stainless steel skewer. And I buy these by the, I think it's a package of eight at the dollar store here in Halifax. And these stainless steel skewers have come in handy for, I can't tell you how many different projects I've used them for. So we're gonna make the hand, handle, the, the hanging handle for this uh, project using the skewer. One last item, probably the most expensive piece altogether is this piece of bar stock. So this is one inch aluminum bar stock, three feet in length, that I picked up here at Canadian Tire and I think it cost me around $6. And that's the single most expensive piece that you will, will need to buy for the way I'm doing this project. And there are options, which we will talk about. Do you know, I also had found an old uh, filing cabinet, the thing that goes in filing cabinets that supports the, the file folders. And they happen to be made of aluminum, one inch. Now they happen to have holes drilled in them, but I was able to pick that up for nothing at one point and I was able to use that just as effective as this. But just because I wanted to show you an option, so this is the bar stock that you can pick up at a local hardware store. Now in, in Halifax it was about $6, I'm not sure it'll cost in your area, but that's going to make the pot stand on top of the hobo stove. So those are the items that I have. Now you also have to see what tools I'm going to use for this project, so stand by for that. Okay, you don't need a lot of expensive or high-tech equipment for this project. You have options, I'll show you what I use, I'll show you a couple of options, and some of them are very inexpensive. But before we begin on the, on the tools that I'm going to use, there's something we need to cover right away, and that is protective measures. So hearing protection of some type, whether or not it's a pair of hearing muffs like this, or a pair of earplugs if you're using power tools, I believe that's an essential piece of equipment. Also essential is a piece of some way of protecting your eyes. So I'm using goggles that I'll put over my glasses when I go to do this project. Again, if you're using power tools, it's essential. Even if you're using hand tools, you don't want small slivers of metal flying through the air and getting in your eyes. So those two things are essential. You may also consider adding a pair of work gloves because you are going to be working with sharp edges of metal. And we'll talk about how to address that as we go along as well. So those are three pieces of safety equipment you want to consider even before you start assembling your tools. All right, let's put those aside. Now, as far as tools are concerned, for me, in cutting the stainless steel utensil strainer, I'm going to use a Dremel tool. Now, my Dremel tool has the extension handle on it, and I'm going to be using a cutting wheel on the end of it, and I'm going to show you a close-up because this one is just about worn out, and I do need to replace it, so I'll show you that one before the project begins. But as an option, you could use, if you're handy with and you have available for, to you, you could use a angle grinder. And the angle grinder, I have used it in the past. It does take a bit of practice because these things, if you're not good with them or if you haven't practiced with them much, they can get away with you and they can cause injury. They can also overcut what you're trying to cut as well. But an angle grinder is a great tool and you can use this for this project. You can even use a pair of metal shears. Now, I'm, I've got a pair of the curved metal shears here, and you can get in and cut through the holes. I will tell you, it's a little bit more difficult to do. It's not quite as even and smooth, but you can address all that afterwards through the use of uh, a couple of other tools, which I'll show you now. You're gonna end up with some raw edges when you cut the hole. 
You want to smooth those out. You don't want to have anything that's going to catch and cut your skin. You don't want anything that's going to catch on any of your equipment, whether it's in your backpack or even the stuff sack. So having a file of some type, in this case it's a nickels and axe file, or a piece of sandpaper if, it's, if the roughness isn't too bad, or both of those tools, they're, they're good to get rid of all those rough edges. A couple of other small tools, just a pair of simple pliers and a, pimp and a, a pair of, or not a pair, sorry, a, a screwdriver with multiple bits uh, just because I chose it for demonstration purposes and they're just simply to put the, the nuts and bolts together when you put it on. And finally, I'm using a flexible metal ruler for this project. It does not have to be a metal ruler at all. It can be anything flexible and a marking pen so I can know where I'm cutting. And the reason I want something flexible is because I'm going to be wrapping it around the outside of the utensil strainer so that I can mark my cutting lines with the, with the marker. All right, basically that's all there is to the tools. So not a lot. You can go very simple, but if you have to have a few tools like either the angle grinder or the Dremel tool, it's going to make the project much easier for you. All right, let's start talking about design. Okay, so the nice thing about the IKEA utensil strainer is it can be used as is for a stove. You don't really have to do anything to this to use it. You simply can build a fire in this right on the ground, place your pot on top, and it will work. Now, not very effectively, but it will work. And there's only there's a few things you can do to make it work more effectively without doing anything at all to the strainer. One of which is placing it on top of some small stones. Now I've just used a small blue piece of material and some little stones here and there's, since the stones are white I wanted to place them for contrast. But if you can find a couple of small stones and place the stove or the IKEA strainer on top of that, you're going to get airflow underneath which is going to enhance the, the airflow through the fire and make it much more effective. Still, you need to do something about the top. Now, you can do this. It may not be the most effective, but it's not bad. I have just a couple of pieces of dry wood here, but if I was going to do this in the woods, I would use green sticks for this. And that is, I would build my fire inside, take two green sticks, because they're not going to last forever when you do this, place them on top, and then I can place my pot of choice on top of that. That allows for airflow and flames to come up from underneath and through and around the outside of the pot. So you can use this absolutely without any modification at all. But we can do much better. So let's talk about what are some of the options for changing this into a much more effective design. All right, in doing some research and deciding what I would do for myself, there are basically two types of feed systems for wood stoves. One is the traditional top feed system that you'll often find, especially with wood gasification stoves, where everything is loaded from the top. And this style has a feed port that's open that allows me to drop sticks in, and of course, optionally, I could be building a, a top-down burn and then add sticks in afterwards. But essentially, as long as the pot, while the pot is on top, I can still feed the stove by dropping sticks in that way. So that's one option. So we could create or modify the IKEA hobo strainer for that type of a burn and that will work well. That's not the option I'm going to choose and I'll, I'll demonstrate why. So one of the design features I really like about the uh, firebox stove, and in fact the Emberlet stove has the same basic design feature, is that yes, you can feed it from the top if that's your, your preference, absolutely, especially if you have a lot of small sticks, it's very easy to feed it from the top. But the firebox stove is designed so that there are two ports, this is the generation 2 firebox, two ports on the side that allow me to feed sticks in from the side. One on this side, and another on this side. Now, the benefit of this is twofold. One, I can constantly feed sticks in without removing my pot from the top of the stove. And two, I can use longer pieces of wood. They still have to be small enough to fit through the feed port, but they don't have to be broken down into small pieces that will fit in through the top. So that's one of the options I really like. In addition, because there is a bit of a height to the feed ports from the ground, the sticks often rest at an upward angle. Well, of course they do, unless you support them somewhere. They're going to go at an upward angle. This creates a bit of a TP effect inside of the stove, and you get a lot of airflow through the wood, and it does burn very well with very few sticks. 
So this is the design I wanted to replicate on the sides of my IKS utensil strainer. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to cut out some of these holes in a pattern that will allow me to feed sticks of different sizes, not so large that I either affect the structural integrity or everything wants to fall out on its own, just large enough that I can feed sticks in through and still have a little bit of a height differential off of the, off of the ground so the sticks will go in in an upward angle. That way I can feed longer sticks in and at the same time if I want, I can still drop in smaller sticks through the top as I go as well. And that often is nice to do if you really want to get just an extra boost of flame uh, to bring your water to a boil, you can just drop in some small sticks while small larger sticks are fed in through the side for a continuous burn. So how are we going to do that? Let's go into that next. Okay for this design I was just considering where I wanted to cut the hole for the feed hole on the side of the utensil strainer and I wanted to decide how big I was going to make it. So what I have decided for this one is I'm going to, you, you'll notice that there's holes running up and down the side and that they make a nice square pattern. So if I go three holes by three holes, I'm going to get a square feed hole that I can use. And the benefit of using those holes as guidelines is, is there's less metal to cut through. If I cut just along the edges, the bottom or outside edges of each of the holes, it makes it just that much easier to cut. Now you do have to be careful. You are going to end up with some uh, ragged edges or some sharp edges, which you'll need to smooth off. Now, Alternatively, I could make this a little larger in a couple of different ways. I could certainly go across the, the support section here and choose as many holes as I want to, but my experience has been that large feed holes are not necessary for this to work. You don't need a whole lot of sticks going in from through the side. When you're at that point that you're feeding sticks in, it's more of a maintenance. If you're really going to start a good fire going, get a base of coals, you're probably going to do it through the top before you even get your pot on. So I'm going to start with the smaller one. Now, what I can do if I start with the smaller feed hole, three holes by three holes big, I can always expand that if I thought that it was too small after the fact. So what I need to do now is just draw some lines to connect those up. Now, could you freehand this? Absolutely, you could. I'm going to recommend drawing lines to work with just as a guide to try to make it as straight and even as possible. So in order to do that, I'm going to use my ruler. Trying to do this so you can see what it is I am doing as best I can. I have my a little longer, my permanent marker, and I just marked to the top on both sides or along the outside of those holes as I mentioned. and across the bottom as well. Now this is where the flexible ruler comes into play here. And you can use plastic, you could use just about anything that will flex and allow you to form it to the outside of the utensil strainer. So you can see roughly what I've done here is I've marked with my blue uh, permanent marker the outside of those holes. And now I'm going to cut that with the the uh, Dremel tool. I'll start the process of showing you how I go about cutting that but I won't make you watch the whole thing so stand by for that. Alright let's get started cutting out the holes on the, the hole on the side of the utensil strainer. I have decided that I would make it a little larger than I first thought. Um, it's up to you of course how big you want this feed port to be. I don't feel it needs to be very big at all but for this one I decided to make it just a little wider than the three by three holes. And after I get that cut, I'll assess it. I could always make it a little larger again if I need to. It's better to start with a little too small and then make it larger, even if you wanted to test the stove out and do a burn in the stove with wood. And then you can always decide to make it a little larger if you want to. If you end up, alternatively, if you cut a great big three inch by three inch hole and you find that it's too big for your needs, uh, you know, you can't go back and add metal to it. So it's better to start small. And even though it's a little bit more work, it, uh, you know, it'll give you the option to make the hole larger afterwards. All right, I'm, I'm going to use my tool. Now I did change out my cutting wheel. As you can see, I've got the full size cutting wheel. Now just a word on cutting wheels. There are basically two types of cutting wheels. There's the small one that I replaced. You can see why it was, I decided to replace this too small for this work. There are two types of cutting wheels, at least that I have. One is the one I'm going to be using, which is the one that's fiber reinforced. It's very similar in a lot of ways to what you'll find on a angle grinder. And there's the other one that it seems to be made of a, a 
porous material that is somewhat like sandpaper compressed. And what I find with these ones is that while they'll make a very fine, I'll give you a close up of it, and I'm not sure what these are called, but while it will give you a very fine cut, I also find them especially fragile. So if you're cutting into metal and you have the least bit of twisting, snap, they break. And then of course you got pieces flying everywhere. So I prefer not to use those for this type of work. I like the cutting wheels that have the fibers in the wheel itself for reinforcement. They seem to cut better and uh, they, you know, they'll, they'll tolerate a little bit of side to side play if you're not as accurate as you would like to be. All right, I do have to put on my safety equipment. So my goggles are on, ear protection is on. And I will, of course, edit out the noise because I find this annoying. I'm sure you will as well. So let's get started here. One side cut, and it will get a little warm by the way, and you probably should know that. Make sure your fingers stay out of the way while you're doing this. It would have been faster with the angle grinder without question. I would be doing that outdoors if I was using the angle grinder, but I decided to go with the Dremel tool for this project because it is, allows you to be more accurate and not uh, cut too large. And uh, I found it a little bit safer as long as you are handling the tool appropriately. So I'm gonna cut the other three sides and then we'll pick up from there. 